Last week we talked about sacrifice and got to hear a couple of your stories on the nature of sacrifice, what it meant when somebody had given up something for you or done something for you that was sacrificial. We've been on this theme and hearing your stories and asking ourselves what it is that brings us to this place. Yes, we have a lovely facility. We have a nice, quiet neighborhood that our facility is situated in. We have programming of various kinds and ministries targeted at everything from our children to our women to our young adults to specialty interests. But what is it at the core of what motivates us? And what is it at the core of what makes us what we are as Christians and brings us to this place, as Adventists and brings us to this place? I suggested last week that sacrifice was at the very core of what it meant to be a Christian, that it wasn't an optional concept. That sacrifice isn't something that's just out there, that it's a word that we think about, but that it's at the very, very core of what it means to believe, what it means to be a follower. In the Old Testament, that looked uh, very different than it does now. In the Old Testament, it looked like a routine of bringing things to the temple for sacrifice, sheep, bulls, if you were poor, doves, whatever it was. There were so many different kinds of, of offerings, sin offerings, thank offerings, seasonal offerings, daily uh, sacrifices that were made in the temples and so forth. Guilt was transferred from an individual to those sacrifices in the case of the sin offerings. And propitiation, temporarily at least, for sin was made. But in the New Testament, we have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world once for all. And so that system, this, this cultic system of sacrifice, stops. And Jesus becomes the one who has given up heaven and earth and taken a chance that we might be redeemed, that we might live. So this becomes the defining characteristic or the defining belief of us as Christians, that Christ emptied himself of heaven, uh, condescended to become one of us in human form, was born of a virgin, lived, died, was resurrected, and that that death was a sacrificial death, that that death was an atoning death, that that death, in that death we've been justified, that the wrath of God has been satisfied, there are lots of different models, of course, for this. Even within Scripture, there's a, a sort of forensic model and there is a model of uh, redemption that has more to do with a ransom than it has to do with uh, the vengeance of God or the anger of God. So we can, we can choose our theology within this, but however we want to look at that, the death of Christ becomes a central focus point for Christianity. And sacrifice becomes the essence or the core of why we're here, what it's all about. So if we're to live as Jesus lived, if we're to be Christ-like, if the call of a Christian is to become more like Jesus than what that looks like is got to be, has got to be shaped by the notion of sacrifice. Is that a fair recap of last week? Am I making sense? All right. The question I have for this week is the question that we all tend to want to ask when it comes to sacrifice and that notion today, because last week I talked a little bit about what a strange idea sacrifice was. We don't find sacrificial thinking, giving, living in our culture much anymore. There are some interesting stories. One I would share with you this week is uh, no doubt based in reality too, and there are a variety of versions and maybe they're all true. I haven't had time to check that out. But the story goes something like this. A young man and his friend and the young man's father were out at sea. And a storm came up and capsized their sailboat. 
And there are multiple variations of this. I'll just hit a few, all of them involving sacrifice. One involves the father sacrificing the son. There's only two life vests or there's only two lifelines and the father gives one to the son and st- I mean to the, the friend instead of his son because he knows his son is saved and the friend is not. So he sacrifices basically his own child for the life of his son's friend. That's one version of the story. The other is that the father himself goes uh, down with the boat or doesn't take a lifeline or a life jacket and throws the line to the friend ostensibly because he's lost. And of course, he has time to reflect on that and turns his life around and changes his life. That's sort of the tail end of that story. But now let's look at that story from the standpoint of sacrifice and let's look at it in the cost-benefit analysis. Let me, let me just kind of play with this with you for a minute. Suppose you had the opportunity to save a life at the cost of your own and the response was that they were so moved by your act of sacrifice that they became not only a Christian but chose to dedicate their life in service to the cause of Christ. Would you think that sacrifice was sort of worth it? You probably would. Some of us very much would think that was worth it. Others might say, well, yeah, that, that sounds actually pretty good. Somebody has been saved as a result of my sacrifice, not just physically, but eternally, and they've turned into a true disciple. They've begun to share uh, and live their lives for Jesus Christ as a result of my sacrifice. That seems worthwhile to many of us. Now let's just do the same scenario. It's somebody we sacrifice our lives for, but they only decide that they're going to be a better person. They've, they've, you've sacrificed yourself for them, and they've appreciated that, And they've decided that because they have this second chance at life, they're going to be a better person. How many of you think that's worthwhile? It's worth laying down your life for someone to continue living to just kind of be a better person, whatever that means. I'm not asking for hands, because I know at some point there's going to be a law of diminishing return here. Let's go to our third scenario. Let's suppose you lay down your life for someone and they're not a particularly fine or noble human being and they decide nothing. They just go on living life the way they've always lived it. And in fact, the same carelessness that brings them to this point where it's your life or theirs actually ends up taking their life a year later. Was it worth it? Now, let's go to our fourth scenario. It's your life or theirs, and you save their life, and the response is, what an idiot. Who would give up life for another? Was it worth it? We're going to sit on that one for a minute. When Jesus Christ laid down his life, he got all of those responses and more. There are tens of millions of people who think, what an idiot. Why would anybody? Well, first of all, can it even be true? Could anybody leave heaven and become a human being and live among us? That's one question for some people. For another, why on earth would he give of himself in that way? That's craziness. And a third response might be, can anybody really Substitute their own suffering or death for mine? That might be a third question some people ask. That's a whole set of responses that we might say, was it worth it? Jesus has gotten the, well, that's a nice story, 
but nothing changes about my life. He's gotten that response from plenty of people too. People still go about their way. They aren't seeking power. They aren't seeking redemption. Don't save me. I don't need saving is the attitude that I hear out there. I'm fine the way I am. Life is what it is. We all are born. We all die. Don't talk to me about anything else. Was it worth it? Jesus, was it worth it? There are some people who hear stories of self-sacrifice or the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and say, you know, that, that's pretty powerful. But you know, I just think all that matters is that we're good people. That's really all that counts. As long as we're just good people, everybody's going to end up in the same place and it's all fine. A lot of people think that. In fact, if a popular sentiment determined the truth, that might just be the truth about our reality. It's not quite what the scriptures teach. It's not quite what Jesus himself taught. And then there are a few who when they hear the story of Jesus and his love and his sacrifice are completely transformed and changed by that story. It comes to them as something of a painful sort of awakening. That there's something terribly wrong in the human condition. That there's a dis-ease that we all feel in one level or another about the way life is and the way life works. Don't you, I, I mean, I'm going to go to some painful places, but when you hit an animal on the road, don't you just feel for a moment like something's wrong with life? It, it isn't the way it's supposed to be? I hate that feeling. You know, a bird flies down and hits the car, and you know, it's happy little bird is dead, it's not going to fly. I mean, it's just, life isn't as it should be. You go to a hospital and you see a child with cancer. Oh, life is not the way it's supposed to be. You pick up the newspaper and you see a picture of a bus on fire. And you know that kids who were going to go to college maybe be the first ones from their families to ever go to college are killed driving to check out college. And killed horribly, nasty death. Nasty death. Life isn't quite the way it's supposed to be. We have a disease, a discomfort with our own selves, even, a sort of nagging psychological thing in most of our heads, unless we just bury it or medicate it or do something else. Things just aren't quite the way they're supposed to be. when we feel disconnected from ourselves and from others, when we struggle in our families, when we notice that we've gotten to a certain age and we don't have any friends, men are particularly sus uh, susceptible to that. Men get to an age and they've left their buddies from high school and they've gone on to their careers and their families and they look around and they go, do I have any friends? I can't tell you how many men are in that situation. Life isn't quite as it's supposed to be. We have that sense. And Jesus steps into the equation and he says, I'm going to make everything new. He had a funeral just the other day. It's a powerful and wonderful ritual. We honor the remains we honor the family. We honor the life that's been lived. It's all very uh, profound, dignified, and beautiful and strange. That which was alive and vibrant and sitting among us just a few weeks ago is gone. Asleep, waiting the resurrection. Jesus makes this sacrifice, and for some of us, the light starts to dawn. There's a different way to live.
a different way to believe, a different way to be in community, a salvation that is come, a salvation that is present in this moment, and a salvation that is yet to be made apparent, a salvation yet to be consummated, a salvation in which the order of things is permanently changed back to the created order, the pre-sin order, if you will. Coming back to my original story and the question, is it worth it? I want to suggest to you today that we don't have the luxury of that question, even though I've made it my topic. Our example didn't say, well, I'm going to be able to save only 3% of humanity. I don't think it's worth it. When I weigh the costs to the benefits, it just doesn't add up. If I could get to 10% or 20% or 50%, maybe. If I could get to 80%, definitely, or 90, that would be awesome. Shoot, maybe we could aim for 100, then no questions asked. But for 3%? Nah, I don't think so. He didn't do that. Nowhere do we have it recorded, nowhere, not in Scripture, not in the writings of Ellen White, not in the sacred counsel from other inspired writers outside of our tradition. Nowhere do we have it written that God did a cost analysis. Nowhere did he ask, will it be worth it? Because when you love, and you love completely, and you love unconditionally, that's never the question, is it? You see? We don't really... Parents, we don't enter parenthood with a cost-benefit analysis. None of us would become parents if we did. None of us. Even for the best of children, it's a daunting task to raise you. Those of you who are young adults and don't have children yet, those of you who are teenagers, we love you dearly. Those of you who are children, we love you dearly. And it is a tremendous and awesome responsibility raising you in a challenge. You're expensive for one thing. Yeah, you're expensive for one thing. And we can never know when you're going to end up keeping us awake all night long in the ER because you broke your arm or something else. Sometimes you have quite the mouth on you. That's always inspiring. Sometimes you treat us like we're dumber than dirt. That's also really inspiring. We love you. But if we did a cost-benefit analysis before we ever entered marriage or before we ever had families, we might not do it. It happens because of love. Love just makes things happen. We have our children. We love them so completely. We never count the cost. Well, maybe a couple of times we do. <laughs> We know how much an automobile is to repair after a car accident. That we might count. We might even bill you for it if you have a job. We know how much college costs. We see what that does to our uh, cash flow monthly. And those private school bills, we know what that's all about. But we never enter this equation. Do we? Parents, am I right? You're so awfully quiet out there. Maybe I'm the fool who didn't do the cost-benefit analysis. <laughs> All of you said, no, I've got the counting sheet right here. I've, I've anticipated it all. You didn't do it. You fell in love. You had a family. That's the way it went. God so loved the world that he just gave his son that whoever believed might have life and not perish. No cost-benefit analysis. 
the essence of what it means to be a Christian comes down to sacrifice. What you have signed up for, and if you need to rethink it, rethink it. Rethink it if you need to. What you have signed up for when you said, yes, I believe, is you have taken on the sacrifice of Christ as your redemption. Now let me tell you what that means. It does not mean that you now need to lay your life down as a sacrifice for the world because guess what? You can't save the world. It's already been done. You are not to bleed your life empty for the sake of whatever's out there because God died that you might live and have life what? Abundantly. Abundantly. But that doesn't mean that you're exempt from sacrifice. And as a people, we used to know this. Let me remind you about a few things. Let me just quickly from history. These are very common pieces of knowledge. I haven't done any great erudite research on this for you. It's just stuff most of us know or ought to know. There was a time in our church where you were not to wear a wedding band. I'm not talking about the pastors. I'm talking about anybody, let alone have any stones in that band, let alone any kind of other baubles. The reason for this was twofold, threefold. One was modesty. There was the sense that plainness was somehow more modest than not. Two was the fact that it was costly and ostentatious and perceived as a sort of selfish thing. Three, and the biggest piece, was that the money was better spent on the work preparing for the second coming of Jesus. Well, in 1989, or eight, no, 70, no, 89, Jesus hadn't come yet, 88, the general conference, they met and said, you know, we can no longer sustain this viewpoint. Wedding bands aren't that expensive. Jesus hasn't come, and we don't need that $120 or whatever it is for the publishing work. This was Ellen White's viewpoint, you see. So they, they said, it's fine. We recognize that this is a symbol of love, commitment, and affection, and we're going to go with that. And most of you, and I, I, I'm not here to, to highlight the jewelry issue at all. Most of you are extremely modest, and if you have something, it has some intrinsic value that might be useful to you in the future, or who knows. Most of you have inexpensive things that you've purchased as accessories, and good for you. You look fabulous, by the way. You look marvelous, yeah. But what I'm trying to get at is that there was a time when we as a people were willing to dress as plainly as possible for the sake of saving and giving as much money as possible because we had a conviction about the soon coming of Jesus Christ and the necessity of funding that in some way, contributing to that work in some way, funding the publishing so that tracts could be delivered, handed out like the leaves of autumn in the winds, you see. Everybody could know about Jesus and his love. We had a thing called 13th Sabbath offering. Anybody know what 13th Sabbath is? The 13th Sabbath, three of you can, okay, great. <laughs> like I said, we've kind of lost this. Um, 13th Sabbath was an anticipated time at the end of a quarter. There were, you started January 1, and the 13th Sabbath of you know, from January 1, the 13th Sabbath, was the end of the first quarter. There were lots of things that went into this. When I was a child, the children had been busy learning memory verses all 13th Sabbaths, and so the divisions would come into the adult Sabbath school division at the time when they had an actual program back in those days that started at 9.15, by the way, while all of you were still in bed. Um, and the, the program featured kids telling their memory verses. It was, it was part and parcel of the celebration of the quarter past. The other thing that had been done is that families were supposed to save funds for a special 13th Sabbath offering, which was considered a sacrificial offering, because this is going to blow your mind. Let me tell you how this worked. Are you ready for this? Oh, Fasten your seatbelts. 
the Adventist giving plan, the understanding of stewardship that we have operated from since our founding is this. The tithes don't belong to you. They belong to God, and you remit them, basically. The church is the storehouse. 10% of your income is remitted back to God because he's asked for that. There is some scripture that would indicate a double tithe is called for, but the church hasn't insisted on that. They've simply said there's the tithes, and then the Bible also speaks of free will offerings. So what is it that we're going to bring beyond that? And you'll see right there on your envelope, so much for church budget, so much for missions, so much for these different kinds of things. Well, in addition to all of that that you were already doing, 13th Sabbath was a special offering in which you were supposed to sacrifice above and beyond and bring something for the sake of mission. This was 13th Sabbath offering. You see, you're in shock. I've lost you. I can see that. No. There was an idea that God's sacrifice could never be met with one of our own. That is to say, we could never earn the value of his sacrifice. We could never give enough to pay him back. We could never, it was never about saying, well, I have to, I have to be worthy of this. For some, maybe, but that was a, a misappropriation. It's never been about your worthiness. God declared you worthy the moment he decided to save you. While you were still lost and in your sins, he declared you worthy. That's why I'm not a big fan of the, oh, what a worm am I theology. You're not a worm. You're a human being. The vestige of God's image has been diminished in us through time because of sin, but you still remain in the vestige of God's image, and he loves you, and he gave himself for you. You're not a worm. I want to be clear that no amount of our personal sacrifice can earn his sacrifice, can earn his gift can repay him for what he has done for us. That's not possible. Get that out of your head. But if we're going to live as Jesus lived, what it does mean is that we empty ourselves in self-sacrifice. Now that's tricky, isn't it? I'm not talking about not participating in the economy of the world around us. There are people called to give up extraordinary things in extraordinary circumstances. I respect those calls, but that's rare. I'm not calling on you to go home and make your own dresses out of rice sacks. I'm not calling on you to do any specific thing except bear in mind as you live and as you move, and as you go through life, and as you give, and you think about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the number one piece you've signed up for, you can always change your mind, but the piece you've signed up for as a Christian is, I will be one who lives out the sacrifice of Jesus in my life. What does that look like? Only you can decide. That's between you and Jesus. But that does mean something. It's going to mean something financially. It's going to mean something in terms of your time. It's going to mean something in terms of your talents. It's going to mean something in terms of the stewardship of your life resources. It's going to mean something in terms of your energies, your perspective, your focus, your values. It will be all-encompassing. Trust me. It'll be all-encompassing. And if it's not, this is just Jesus knocking on the door saying, I want access to the whole of your life. Come, learn of me. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Let me help you. Let me help you. This is the call. This is the essence of Christian living. I can't distill it down to anything simpler than that. It's not just about money. It's not just about time. It's not just about any of these pieces. It's all-encompassing. 
So let's bring it in from the Word. Our psalm, the call to worship, says in verse 7, No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. That's what the psalmist says. That goes to our point this morning that only Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. Only Jesus can save another and ransom the life of another. That comes to us fairly clearly. Our Old Testament reading. This is wonderful. The psalmist is, I mean, the, uh, the author of Isaiah is giving us a poem. Listen to me. Hear me, people and nation. Instruction will go out from me or come from me. My justice will be a light. My salvation is on the way. My strong arm will bring justice. It's a triplet. The islands will look to me and await in hope for my strength. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Look at the earth beneath. All of this will vanish or wear out and its inhabitants too. But the last line, my salvation will last forever. My righteousness will never fail. That's our God. Our New Testament tells us how to live. Ephesians says, be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. God has acted toward us in Christ. Forgiven us, freed us, sacrificed for us. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Son, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what's our response to all of this? We live as he lived, sacrificially. We're kind, compassionate, forgiving, just as God has been that way toward us. And we're to follow his examples because we are his children. And to be thankful for everything, particularly giving thanks to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're in a very uh, interesting and holy week. We celebrate the resurrection a week from tomorrow. But before there was a resurrection, there was a sacrifice. Before there was a resurrection, there was a crucifixion. Before there was a resurrection, there was a death. And before death was suffering. Later, it says, knowing that everything had now been finished and so the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Scripture says, Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friend. Giving up our spirit is the ultimate sacrifice we can make. And it was the ultimate sacrifice the Son of God made. He breathed his last and he died on that cross. He gave all. He risked everything. And he did it for a result that wasn't guaranteed. He did it for those of you who would hear and respond. He did it for those of you who would hear and respond and fall away. He did it for those of you who would hear and respond and ultimately reject him. He did it for those of you who just have decided maybe to live a little better life. 
He did it for those of you who would not change anything. Take no notice of his gift. Leave it on the table. And he did it for those of you who would mock him and say, how stupid. Why would anybody do that? And he never asked if it was worth it. We're headed for a time in our future where living out the sacrifice of Christ is going to be increasingly important. And I want to challenge you to begin disciplining yourselves now and learning what that road looks like now because that is it, the essence and heart of what we're about.